Good morning, everybody. It's Friday, finally a Friday, September 7th. On a short week, we had Monday off, as you all know. Um, well, basically, we got some exciting things going on in the market. You can see the NASDAQ composite. I just want to make sure real quickly that everybody can see my screen okay. Do you hear me okay? All is good. All is well in Cyberland. Very good. Uh, you can see, obviously, I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer. you got a breakout in the major market indexes, the NASDAQ, the S&P from these kind of cup and handle type formations. So all of that on the surface looks quite positive and underneath the surface as well things were looking positive before we had the breakout uh, yesterday and we've been talking about that and you know the interesting thing is we, we didn't really come out with a webinar or we didn't really think we wanted to come out with a webinar say on Wednesday or Thursday when you had all the news, ADP jobs number and then this morning you know commenting before uh, this morning's jobs number because a lot of it is just kind of news noise and if you really are paying attention you might notice that you're really just able to watch your stocks and operate on that basis you almost shut out any news sources and, and try not to overthink all of that we get a lot of emails uh, and I'd have to say over time from existing members that have been with us for a while we see fewer and fewer of them and I think that tells you that people understand essentially that news does not really play a big factor. Now there are some times when news comes into play and we'll get to that in a little bit here when I start talking about stocks, but essentially you know, you're know, you in a nice big giant breakout on in the uh, general market indexes. You can see on the NASDAQ here big cup and handle breakout. Huge volume. You know, If that were a stock you'd be all over it, so of course we have to conclude the same thing about the market. The model, the market direction model remains on a buy signal and so far it's been a reasonably uh, profitable buy signal and uh, you know, I feel sorry for all the people who bailed out uh, in the last two three weeks because eventually when we see a maximum number of people bail out which really isn't that many but on a relative basis we did see a little bit of a pickup right Dr. K people kinda saying I can't trade this trendless market and blah 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 right uh, and, and that's kind of what happened uh, last uh, July uh, 2011 um, July was uh, a really tough month because it was uh, dragging on uh, trendlessness and so people started to drop off like you know well not like flies because as you say it's, it was just a it was just a pickup in the um, in, in the number of people that comment you know they're going to step out of the market for now and they're going to come back later or some people just throwing out throwing in the towel altogether because they get just disgusted fed up with the market and so we saw that same repeat over the last uh, few weeks yeah, and so it's, it's not really that many people, uh, but it is, you do see a pickup, and it does seem like it maxes out just before something big in the market happens, but you, you do see that pickup or that bump. And, you know, with the market breaking out now, you have a pretty clean upside trend, and I would imagine that we're, all systems are going unless you see this breakout fail. But let's keep in mind one thing. Yesterday was a big move, and today we had a weak jobs number, which brings into play, of course, the Fed next week uh, with QE3. And I don't know, for those of you who saw uh, my appearance this morning on Fox, I, I don't really think that the move by Mario Draghi, the proposal that the European Parliament also allegedly agreed to yesterday about this uh, sanitized bond buying, essentially where they're going to buy short-term bonds and then sell, uh, offset that but with sales of other assets. So I'm not really sure how that liquefies a system necessarily with some sort of QE, but what it does, I, I guess the idea, correct me here, Dr. K, if, if you see it another way, but it looks like what they're trying to do is drive down short-term interest rates to make it easier for insolvent sovereigns like uh, Spain and like Italy, uh, Italy, I want to say idiotly, but Italy, uh, sell short-term paper so they can keep themselves just afloat by, a, by the hair on their chinny, chin, chin. But that's what it looks like to me. And uh, the market did have a big move yesterday, but I'm, I'm thinking, is the market rally related so much to QE as for the, the, the potential of a change uh, in the coming election? Um, or are we just going to get changeless change like we have been getting? Uh, or does the market start to see something in terms of an inflection point for economic policy? And so you have to consider that besides there being a QE driver, there also is the short-term, uh, what we might call a Romney ra rally, potential and we saw that in the night in 1980 when Reagan came into power of course after Reagan took office you had a pretty decent correction because it seems like the market first discounts the change in the election and then once the new person is in office it then begins to back off as it waits to see whether new policies will take root and well, also it was what Arthur Laffer pointed out to Reagan um, when he shortly after he took office that he should not have phased in the tax cuts that was that was part of the problem but that gets pretty technical 
um, you know, in hindsight, he should have just brought the tax cuts in, right. in full measure, and then uh, that would have avoided the uh, the that fairly nasty recession we had back then. Yeah, but you know, by 1984, Reagan had 13 uh, percent. GDP growth, and so three years into his presidency, whereas Obama, you're looking at a little over one and a half, maybe not even that percent uh, currently. But supposedly we're supposed to give him more time so that the, as Bill Clinton said the other day, so that the economic foundation he has built can begin to produce results. I don't know. I, was, I had a hard time not just entirely rolling on the floor in laughter. LMAO, as we might say, but. Uh, I think that that's a possibility too, you know. And for those of you who love Obama and think that we can have a big rally on him being reelected, I would tend to argue that point. But you know, you can believe whatever you want. Some people believe in the Easter Bunny too. But uh, but you know, I'm not trying to be too sarcastic. Uh, but that's how we're looking at the market, you know. So you're in an uptrend. Nothing really else to think about uh, in terms of that. And there are stocks to buy. Now I, I want to get to one real quick because this is the one, obviously, that people are going to be uh, wigging about a little bit. Uh, there's a couple of things on Mellanex. You know, this morning somebody stifled, Nicholas Stifle or somebody came out and downgraded the stock to hold from buy. Also, there was news from Intel, which is clocking Intel pretty good right now. I think about three or four uh, percent that uh, they're lowering their guidance going forward. And and you know that there is this big deal with Intel where they started to use their uh, I guess their switches or what is it, Doctor K, that Intel is using on Mellanex? Uh, yeah, I don't remember the exact. Uh, some one of our listeners probably knows, but one of the um, the switching ICs um, in their in their. Yeah, but in any case, Intel is a customer, and I guess they were they're in line to uh, do a fair bit of business with the uh, Mellanox. But remember, they're just a small company, a 4.63 billion uh, market cap versus uh, what what is Intel? Six six hundred or what is it? Intel's got to be at uh, 100. Oh, we're at 121 now. 121.37 billion. So you know, the, probably the business it has with Mellanox is not that significant in the grand scheme of things. But you know, that said, you have to watch and see what the stock is doing today. There's a couple things, though. I mean, we own some of this, so we're kind of watching it right now because we started coming in right about 109, 110, right in here. So you're pulling right back into where uh, we entered the stock. Now you. you you haven't violated the 10-day technically yet, and, and we'll see where this comes down to if it gets some support. Maybe it gets some support here and bounces. The way I look at it, this is not a big position for us. If it is a big position for you and you don't have some cushion on it, then you probably need to be taking some action in terms of cutting the position back. But you know, the other thing that can buy you some uh, some time is if you own some of these leaders. We ha we're big in cores and we're big in... Uh, LinkedIn and these stocks are just rocketing and so they've provided more than adequate cushion to try and see what this does you know but we could blow it out by the end of the day maybe even sooner maybe in the middle of this presentation for all I know but I'm waiting to see if it gets some kind of a lift uh, and whether this becomes the mother of all buying opportunities but there's a couple of things to keep in mind here when you're dealing with this and when you're thinking about this and and that is you know if you're gonna give it some time as we are, are doing right now you got to have an out point, some point in here, pretty quickly, and and uh, you could be getting there rather quickly, even uh, maybe in the middle of this webinar. But the thing is, you're way above the two a day moving average, so I don't know what that would be. What is that, Doctor? About 100 percent above the moving average. So uh, usually when they start to get, you. yeah, what's the maximum number you like to before you like to be blowing that out? Actually, in in this case, I, I don't really care about the 200. Day moving average. I'm just yeah. looking at you know the stocks made a huge move and it was downgraded based on valuation, which is the you know that that often is a, a signal to go ahead and buy on the weakness um, right. when that occurs. And uh, you know as far as if, if there's something more material going on, because um, the, the, a downgrade, a simple downgrade to hold from buy on valuation usually doesn't take a stock down this far. So the, right. the Intel news is probably weighing in on it to some extent, and the question is the how valid that that news or how significant that is um, to Mellanox. And it it's just it, to me right now, it just seems like even though there's quite a bit of volume on this, um, this is this is where the stock will get support and uh, it'll it'll turn back around and can resume its uptrend. Yeah, and so that's our really our thinking. So we're kind of hanging loose here and see what happens. The the beautiful thing is that we had a great August. And we started out September very well with the big move in LinkedIn, that being a big position, and cores busting out to new highs. And we only need, you know, two or three stocks, two or three big positions and big stocks moving. That makes a lot of money. We'll have several other positions that are smaller, although silver is another big position. So in our thinking, and remember, you have to think about this. If you own Mellanox and it's 100% of your account, then you have a problem. 
you have to think about how you're going to mitigate risk if it continues going lower. Now, as Dr. K just said, we tend to think, and if you go back and you look at leading stocks of the caliber of Mellanox, which we think it is, this sort of news should not last too long. And you know that O'Neill has that old rule that if you do uh, see your stock break on news, uh, you give you might give it a day or two to see if that passes and the stock writes itself again. So I would operate on that basis, give it a time stop. In other words, if it doesn't continue a lot lower and the volume doesn't remain very high without some support coming in. But you're kind of at a level where you might see some support. You could always pull all the way back to the 50-day moving average here, 97.25. But uh, are we using what are we what are we using here, Dr. K? The 10-day or the 50-day on the uh, uh, with the seven-week rule here, I'm trying to count this. We're well, we got the seven-week seven rule. We're we're actually in. We, it's it's gone seven weeks. So if it violates okay. the 10-day, then we got to use the 10-day uh, based on that rule to sell it. Yeah. So you would and sell that's good it because that that means we'll 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 have a you know we'll have a profit in it. <laughs> and if we're wrong, if it turns back up and goes, it'll probably most of these leading stocks will issue another uh, pocket pivot. A continuation sure. pocket pivot. So we'll just get back in at that point. We'll pay up a little bit more, whatever. Um, but you know, it's a uh, it's nice to be able to exit um, at a profit. Yeah. So yeah. So we'll just see what happens. And so for those of you who own it and you're watching it come down today, hopefully you have some of these other stocks. But you know, it's it's up there, and you have these pocket pivots, and you have several of them uh, along the 10-day moving average. It never really leads to a sharp upside move. We had a good one. Uh, Right here, I guess what was that on uh, on Monday, I suppose, or Tuesday rather, and uh, stock ran up to 120 roughly, and then just kind of peeled back, and so here it comes down. So now it's correcting. Maybe it undercuts these lows in here and get some support right around here. But this is kind of where we're looking for some support. So if you don't own it and you want to own it, you might keep your eyes peeled here, or even if you're daring enough, you could take a position and then just set yourself a stop a couple, three percent lower or, or on the basis of a 10-day violation. So in a way, if you're not in the stock, you kind of have an interesting uh, potential trade here with minimum risk because you are looking at a 10-day moving average, assuming the stock doesn't move another 5% to the downside by the end of the day. But that's kind of how we're looking at it. So you, you notice we're not panicked, we're not uh, freaking out, we're not uh, suicidal. There's really no emotions about it. We're just kind of handling it. Of course, I have to admit it's nice to have these other stocks that have moved for us very well over the past few days, uh, providing some cushion so that we can sit through this. But that's what the, the story is with that. And I know that's the number one stock in everybody's mind. The other one is this one that we've never really wanted to buy because it's kind of erratic and it's breaking down. But, you know, this thing, I don't know, what do you do, Dr. K? This thing's been following the 10-week now, or the 10-day rather, for at least seven weeks now, has it? Uh, well, it looks to me like it, the last time it violated it was in early July. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, you uh, you would sell this on a 10-day violation because it's it's obeyed yeah, a 10 so, 10 day for at least seven yeah. weeks. And I've never really cared too much for the stock myself. It's kind of erratic. It's a little bit smaller. Uh, not necessarily the biggest quality leader uh, in my book. I I much prefer a stock like say LinkedIn. Or cores, and I've studied the uh, institutional sponsorship in LinkedIn for a while, and that's one of the reasons we remain uh, bullish on the stock, and even picking off some pocket pivots off the 10-day right here, and then this one here uh, was a pop above the 50-day, so you had a couple of pocket pivots in there where you could have been buying it, and I always thought the stock was doing okay. I never really saw it as being under distribution. When you come down the left side here, you, you get some supporting action off the lows because you close uh, right about there. And then here you do come down harder, but on this week the market was coming down. Then on this week you have some pretty heavy volume, but you do close actually up uh, from where you started out the week. And uh, you close mid-range. So, so that's decent uh, supporting action. Next week you come down, but on lighter volume. And then the selling pretty much dries up on the weekly chart. You see this big turnaround here off the 200 day moving average. To me, that's that's accumulation. Another couple of things to look at here is when you have these pickups in volume here, you're closing well enough for part of the range. So along these lows, and you know, when it gets down into the 90s, uh, you do see support for the stock. And you have continued to see support for the stock uh, whenever it has pulled back. And I know I was short this thing in here when it broke down to the 200 day moving average. And I actually turned around, took a profit and covered it, and then decided to try working on the long side. And we've been buying it in the low 100s uh, on weakness. And finally, we get this big, massive pop. And so now we're loaded on it. And it looks like it's acting pretty well. It's holding above 
uh, the left side of the base right now roughly. You could pull in a little bit more, and I think that would be normal. And it is, you know, it's it's run up pretty good so far, three days in a row. But it may just hold tight. So don't think you're going to lock in some profits and unload the stock, and it's going to uh, oblige by pulling back. The thing could very well uh, just hold very tight and then blitz again. You know, a good example of that I think is cores, which you know you could have. This could have scared you. A reversal day, and what we'll do is we took a very heavy position here at 48, but it runs up 10 percent or so back off a little bit and wait, wait, wait. Then when I see it starting to dry up on the selling, I'll come back into my position. And yesterday morning, I'm just loading the boat on this thing at 53. And uh, and Ross Haber, who maybe he's on this, he can vouch for this. I told him uh, I'm working uh, LinkedIn and Coors very heavily this morning. That was yesterday morning. And so we got a nice pop in there. That was very nice to see. So, you know, so far so good uh, with Michael Coors. Not a lot of volume. I'd like to see a pocket pivot, but it doesn't really have to happen. Uh, let's go through a couple other stocks real quick. Uh, Regeneron just continues moving higher, so there's nothing really there. But the entire uh, biotech space has been uh, literally on fire, or at least flaming to some extent. You see the pocket pivot here on Onyx uh, last uh, Friday, which we alerted you all to the next uh, Monday or Tuesday. The stock moved up, paused on Wednesday, moved up again. Uh, yesterday, now we're at the top of the base. Maybe it's going to go sideways, or maybe it just continues going higher. That one's very strong. I've been a little bit surprised by the continued uh, strong action in Affimax in terms of price movement. You don't see any volume in there, but it has continued to go higher, and it's now over 19. Another one that uh, worked pretty well is Seattle Genetics on this pocket pivot. It ran up three days very quickly. This is an odd stock. It has 24.5 days of short interest in it. And uh, I'm not sure what the shorts are thinking on this one, but I'm wondering if you're starting to see some kind of a squeeze. But I would uh, look at this. Here's a pocket pivot. Then you broke out of this little short. It's really a five-week cup with handle type base. And maybe it pulls back to 28. If you wanted to buy it, you could. Uh, I would have preferred to buy the pocket pivot uh, and be in it there. But, you know, if that's... If this does pull in, it might become viable. You've seen that on a couple of these, like yeah, NSM. This, the nature of it, though, is it tends to be pretty choppy. So I'm not surprised if it if it pulls back in pretty aggressively. Yeah, no, it is choppy, and you get these nice. But you know, you have a very nice move, a 10% move in just three days. It's not that's a very nice trade in this market. Yeah. So when you get on the upside, it works great <laughs> on yeah. these types of names. Yeah, and you don't want to be sitting around too long on the downside. So. Um, but, you know, that's not the most, the heaviest uh, or the best quality biotech. You know, you got Biogen is broken out and uh, it is hanging in tight after the breakout, so that looks okay. Uh, Alexion is uh, trying to make it, you know, heading for new highs. I think that the closes here, this would be a new high. So all of this, this entire group is acting very well. You even have, have Amgen continuing to move higher. You have uh, Celgene. It's pulling back today, but Celgene broke out yesterday and is trying to move higher again today. And so overall, uh, you know, the biotechs just look like a very strong place to be. And we've got some positions in a number of these uh, since we do like them and they have continued to uh, treat us with a fair bit of love so far. You know, not that they're not without their own uh, set of... Uh, conditions that can come into play at times. So anyways, I'm watching Mellanox get tagged a little bit more. So Dr. K, you better get in here and start buying some. Get yeah, same really. Around. Support the stock, <laughs> huh? <laughs> anyways, um, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Uh, where else are we? Let's see. Let's go through some questions here since we got quite a number of them. Um, okay, let's go to your, uh, your famed... Uh, UVX TVIX model. That's okay. I, I understand that there's the no limit. Out of the shoot, knew it. <laughs> What's that? I knew that would be the first question out of the out of the shoot. Yeah, yep. Yeah. I understand there is no limit on how much of UVX or XLV you can buy because they just keep purchasing more to meet your demand. But when the market changes and you want to sell quick, do there need to be buyers on the other end, and will the lack of buyers diminish liquidity? Uh, works on both sides, buying and selling with these uh, ETFs and ETNs in general. Uh, you got arbitrage going on constantly. So even if it's a thin ETF um, it, and you buy a lot of shares, you should be able to get those shares pretty quick, instantaneously uh, without moving moving the price. But I always advise people again, you know, just don't assume that. Definitely, if you're going to be if you're buying into a thin ETF, do do test the waters before going in whole hog. Um, plenty of ETFs are completely liquid and so you know even buying it would be pretty difficult to even buy one percent of the uh, daily trade in, in most of these names unless you're dealing you know unless you're planning on buying you know 
$500 million position. Okay. Go down here and see if we've got some more questions. Someone says, Gil, your screen looks frozen. Does my screen look frozen to everybody? doesn't look like that way to me. It's, it's probably your internet. Can you s expand on the market pulse suggestion to weigh on additional purchases of gold and silver? Well, I think that's pretty simple because they're extended right now. So there's no real way. There's no buy point. The last buy point was right here on a pocket pivot off the 10-day moving average. Since then, you've had one, two, three gaps to the upside. And so we're just sitting tight. I guess you have two buy points. You had a pocket pivot in here, you have a pocket pivot here, two buy points uh, for silver, and it's off and running. So we've been playing this with the AGQ, and uh, it's been a pretty wild ride so far. Near term, I have a, I can generate a near term price target using point and figure charts uh, of 42 uh, for silver. I talked about that today on uh, Stuart Varney's show on Fox Business News, and uh, gold. Same thing going on there. So the last buy point was off the 200-day moving average. So, so you could have just bought this pocket pivot. Even if you were scared out in the morning when we started to sell off, that was the day that Bernanke was giving his speech at Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And even if uh, you were scared out, you could have just turned around and, and bought back. And I'm, I'll tell you what I did on the AGQ, which we have. On that morning, I did trim a little of my position, and then once this happened, I just turned around and started buying it back. And who cares if I buy it at 50 cents or a dollar higher? I don't care, and I'm glad I did that because it's now a lot higher. So I think that you know, don't be afraid of the buy signals when you see them because when these things get going, they can really get going. Uh, and so I think uh, we're just waiting now for the next buy signal, and that's, that's a ways away from now. You would need to see, I think, the 10-day catch up to uh, gold or silver, which looks a little better. Remember the AGQ is a two times leverage silver ETF and you got to be careful with that one because that thing flies. Um, let's see, but you know you got uh, how far down? 163.25 so that's a ways down to the 10 day. So my guess is you're going to have to see this move sideways at some point and give some time for the uh, 10 day moving average to uh, catch up. You think the same thing Doc, Dr. K? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you just got to, this is where patience uh, is very key. Um, you got to really wait for that window to open properly um, and don't jump ahead of it. And, uh, you know, yeah. there's going to be other opportunities uh, since the markets are dynamic. Um, so, you know, it's important not to get too um, too focused on a name you feel is getting away from you, like, like GLD or SLV. Yeah, but the other thing is also when you have the signals, you have to act, you know, and you can't be hesitant or nervous. If you have a signal, you decide how much of a position you're going to take, what size position, because uh, you, you, you have to think about how much you're willing to lose on the trade, and you operate on that basis. So, right. Just don't uh, I know that never force uh, it. as much as you want to be in the position, never never force it. And uh, you know, especially some of these uh, hot stocks that do do make big moves in a short amount of time. If you missed it, you missed it, and wait for the pullback or move on. Yeah. And you know, on top of that, uh, I would say that you don't don't get greedy because you're never going to have enough when something is going up the way these things are going up. So whatever you bought, you don't have enough. And even though we bought a pretty decent sized position, I'm still sitting here watching this thing go up and thinking to myself, man, I should have bought more. But yeah, that's hindsight. And I don't know about you, but my hindsight is a perfect 2020, um, and best not paid attention to. Uh, anyway, so that's where we are with the metals. Just let them run. Uh, somebody's asking about. Fleet core. They had a pocket pivot yesterday, so it's pulling back uh, into uh, the pocket pivot. So that's about it. If you wanted to buy on the basis of the pocket pivot, then I guess the pullback is viable. Anything else to add on that, Dr. K? That's that's about it. I mean, it's still in buying range. It's pulling back on low lower volume, and so it's completely within uh, the pocket pivot uh, buy range. And the same same with the goes for the viable gap ups as well. Um, if, if if ensuing days, you know, if you missed a viable gap up in the stock opened and then streaked higher. By say six percent, so you got a long bar, um, and then suing days it might pull back closer to the low of that range. And if it does so constructively, you can then initiate your position there. Yeah. So I mean, so it's right there. So not too much to think about that. What do you guys think about DK? Uh, well, I don't know. We don't think too much of it. It's kind of a thinner stock. It's up there and running along the ten day. It looks to me like you would be using the ten day line as your Selling guide, so a violation of the 10 day moving average would be your sell signal. That's about it. There's nothing else to think. 
Triple D we talked about. Uh, REGN, did it have four pocket pivots in the last five days? Yeah, it did, and you won't see us putting out alerts on every single one, but it's pocket pivot-like action. See, I think these two here, these are pocket pivots. This is a pocket pivot, but it's extended from the 10-day, and yesterday would be a pocket pivot, but it's also very extended from the 10-day. But the stock continues to act well, so you know, we have a position, and uh, I think we've added to it a couple times, but we're just hanging out and sitting with that, so not really trying to think about it too much at this point. But it's acting well. And that's good, especially if you own it. Thoughts on SPPI? Not something that we have played with, so don't really have any thoughts about it. It's a dog. I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Dr. K, anything to add? Yeah, it's too thin to short, so. Yeah. So, yeah, and I wouldn't short it, definitely. Uh, Expedia, what do we think of that? You know, the price line has been weak, but here's something interesting. It might be viable. Uh, this is a kind of a bottom fishing pocket pivot coming up. Uh, you had one yesterday off the 10-day, and now it gets above the 200-day moving average, coming into some resistance. But what I notice here, and this is just to put Expedia into some context with the group, is that if this does start to act better and try to build a base and hold up, then maybe Expedia can come around and hold. Let's look at the weekly chart, because you can see here's the big breakout. It's basically coming around. It's right off the 10-week or the 50-day moving average, so it's acting okay on that basis, and so you might consider it to be viable off of the 50-day moving average or the 10-day, but so far I don't think you've had enough volume for a pocket pivot anywhere. So is that right, Dr. K? Yeah, that's right. Let's see, racks. You know, I got to tell you, I'm a little bit uh, ticked off about racks, mainly because I, I started buying it in here on the Bible Gap Up, and it was a risky trade. And I don't think we mentioned this as a Bible Gap Up, but I thought if it held the low, you know, when it pulled in here, if it held that low, that's a low risk uh, trade to make. And I was rewarded with that, but I figured it would move up to around the 5960 level, and then it would have to move sideways. Because if you look at this this weekly chart, I mean, you could say, and I know we had some questions about that, you could say it's a, a punch bowl of death, or it could be, but it sure isn't acting like it. Notice it closed very well this week because you had the gap up. Then each of the past four weeks so far, you're at the peak of the range, and it's acting very strong. But it is, uh, it does fit in with this whole stack theme, and I. Let's say I get the term stack, I think, from one of our members. Who, I guess what it means is all those servers out there that represent the cloud. And so Rax is a stack company in terms of server space. But then so is Amazon. And so I've actually liked Amazon better. And you can see Amazon running away. Had a pocket pivot yesterday and running away to the upside. Uh, the thing about Amazon I think that's very favorable is that you're just emerging from this pattern here. So you're bar barely just clearing to all-time highs. And I think that uh, this has room to run. So, you know, that said, I think among the other big stock, NASDAQ stocks, uh, Apple, I'm watching for a pocket pivot there. I don't know. We didn't quite get anything like that yesterday, but looking for some kind of pocket pivot along the 10-day line. But I think Apple is fine as well. Um, some of the other ones, iSearch, which broke down, still a dog. You don't want to be touching that one with a 10-foot pole. Let's see some of the other big, uh, let's see what Intel is doing right now. Intel getting hacked. But see, Intel was a dog beforehand, and that's one of the reasons why I have a hard time believing that Mellanox just falls apart here on the basis of something happening to Intel, because I don't really think their business is all that much affected by and they have plenty of other customers uh, elsewhere and probably some big uh, contracts coming out uh, going forward. But it was already a dog. Intel was already a dog. So I don't think it's, uh, it has anything to do really with the market right now, and I wouldn't use it as a basis for being bearish or timid about the market. So some of the other ones, Baidu has uh, been a dog. It almost looks like a short here, like it wants to go short. You can see the other Chinese Internet, same thing. I actually did short some netties a couple days ago. Having a couple of shorts always helps me uh, in the mar when the market's you know, being a little bit floppy, being short a couple of stocks and getting a couple of bucks, a couple, three, four bucks out of them uh, always is uh, nice while you're waiting for your longs to uh, get going again. And this broke, but this rally, I don't know if this becomes shortable here on a weekly chart. You can actually see it's a head and shoulders. You have the big break here, and I would think that this is likely to lead to more downside. But the question is, in this kind of market, do you want to be short these stocks? And I'm not sure. You know, yes, last night the Shanghai index, I think it was up, what, 3.7%, Dr. K? And the, the Chinese are talking about easing again, or there's some sort of 160 billion yuan stimulus. I don't know. There's some news. 
but you know you got that working for the market right now. And so I'd rather be long stocks like LinkedIn and short some of these other stocks. But they do look doggy. Uh, let's go through some more questions. PCRX. Oh, they came out with earnings. No, no, that was PCYC. PCRX continues to act well. You know, you just have these continuous pocket pivots off the 10-day moving average. I think you get one, two in a row here uh, off the 10-day. So it, this is addable here. And it was there was a pocket pivot down here, and we did alert you to that. And so the stock is acting uh, acting fine. It's a small stock, and it has that. I think it's Anabrel or Exabrel, the uh, non-opiate based pain management drug, also known as a painkiller, I guess. And uh, that's doing pretty well. So <clears throat> I think they came out with earnings uh, not till October. So they just came out in August, and they were up 47% on a relative basis, but they're still losing money. So it's a riskier one, but I, I think I like for my money right now, I like the way Onyx is acting. Um, you know what? I have to back up here because on PCRX, these were the pocket pivots off the 10-day. I was looking at a weekly. Uh, and it's acting okay. So, But I like Onyx right now in, in this area. I think this is getting ready to go and maybe it goes sideways so I'd use any weakness to be buying that. Um, and of course Regeneron is another one that we favor. <clears throat> Somebody said, let's answer this question, is today's low uh, below the intraday low of the close? You mean this close here? So they're asking, is this a 10-day violation, Dr. K? If this closed underneath the 10-day moving average and this has now gone below it, yeah. uh, is that a that, violation of the 10-day? That, that actually is that's a good point. Um, you know, when you look when you look at these things and you see on the August 30th, it did close below that. So you could actually say that this this would be a violation of the 10-day, and it could be sold on you know on that violation. On as that basis, right? On 111.77. <laughs> That would yeah. be a ten-day violation. That's a good, a very good uh, point. Um, and generally, just to stay in in consistency with how we handle uh, violations, that would this is, that would be a violation. Yeah. So you know, we could make the argument we should we could sell it right now. You know, since it is. Below All right, here we line. go. Let me get my mouse. Click, 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 click. We're out. Okay. Huh. Anything else? What are we doing next? Let's see. TRN. Do we like TRN? What do I think about it? Uh, there's really not too much to think about. That's what the base looks like. It's a little funky. There's a lot of stocks like that. But, you know, you had a pocket pivot here, so if you want to try and play something like that, I guess you could buy it. Not something we're looking at. I know that they uh, they make railroad cars. Is that right? <clears throat> um, so I think it's too low in its pattern, 60 relative strength. So not something I'd be looking at. We're more focused yeah, more on... Of a bottom. It's not a bottom fisher, but it's a mediocre based on yeah. its technicals. And we're more focused on some of these, uh, you know, big leading names. You know, we're looking for big stocks. And when I, I study sponsorship, and I've been following the sponsorship in LinkedIn for a long time, and so I think that has potential to be a big stock. Mellanox, until today, was a big stock and may still be a big stock. We'll see how it closes. Um, and by the way, course. Intel owns about 10% of Mellanox, so that's obviously adding to the, to the Oh, is uh, that downside. what that's all about? Okay. Whoopie do. Still, it's only it's only a ten percent position, and so I don't. It seems like the that um, Melox is down quite a bit um, in the face of that. Right, but on the other hand, it's so far up there. I could see people looking for an excuse to take profits. So. Exactly, and and that's the thing about like these, you know, this this ten day uh, violation. I mean, I I'm not I'm not sitting here selling my Melanox. I'm sitting on the position because my view is, you know, I could sell it on. That violation uh, that that occurred, uh, you know, going below the low of August 30th. But my view is, um, it just it, it seems a bit excessively oversold now. Tomorrow, if it goes below today's low, I'll probably sell the whole position out. Now I'm not going to argue. Yeah. But there's yeah, little that's, little that's ways you can fit, uh, you can fudge your, you know, the, you don't have to stay 100% ironclad to every single rule. You can make little fudges, but make sure that they stay small. In other words, my little fudge is going to be. Tomorrow, if we get a violation, or in subsequent days, and then I'm going to sell it if it goes below today's low. That would be exactly. my little, you know, and that, that's going to cost me about what one and a half percent on uh, right on the on the trade. So it's worth right. to me. It's so, worth the risk. Right, and you given given how much we've made on stocks like LinkedIn or Coors or even Silver recently, within the grand scheme of things, it's pretty tolerable. So, but you know, stuff like this happens, and you have to be ready for it. When it happens, and, I'm, and it's, it's probably good that we waited to have this webinar until today because it gives us an opportunity to actually discuss a real-world example and how we're dealing in it. We're we're probably going to wait and see how this thing closes, and then maybe what it does tomorrow. 
there's always potential you could trim the position, or if you really got big kahanas, you'd come in and start buying the heck out of it, thinking that if it blows through 107 or something, you're just going to toss it. But, you know, that's kind of how we look at things. And, you, and sometimes uh, in a big leader, you can go back and look at daily charts of any big leader, and they do have days where they spin out. And I know that in the past, Dr. K, we've played stocks and seen those types of moves in stocks, and, and today we look at some of those charts and we ask ourselves, gosh, would we sit through something like that today given the level of news noise that we seem to get un inundated with. Because I remember at O'Neill, we didn't have very many sources of news. I would keep the TV on in my office so that I could watch CNBC or something because we'd often have an institutional client call and say, oh, did you see that thing on CNBC? Uh, and I know some of the salespeople used to put CNBC on because they would look for some guy, come on and see if they could prospect him, you know, call him up and sell him and say, oh, I just saw you on CNBC and whatnot. But we were pretty well insulated from news, and it seems like uh, some of the moves that strike us as scary today, when you look back in history and stocks that we've played, we sat through some pretty hairy moves if you're sticking to your rules. And so I think that's really a, a paramount importance, but also understanding that you will have uh, some snap uh, breaks in the stocks once in a while, and then you just got to see how it acts. So for all you know, like I said, this is a, the mother of all buying opportunities, or you're just bailing out here, but, you know. <clears throat> Someone says the daily MLR is very helpful. Well, we're glad. We actually we were, we're doing that uh, for uh, just sending some notes to a, a radio show, and then we decided to, that we could expand that and just send it out as a morning uh, pre-market pulse. Uh, Watson Pharmaceutical got a Bible gap up, and you're holding the Bible gap up. So there's really nothing else to think. It's hanging in fine. Technically, it's fine. Lulu is uh, I, I like the, I like the action in Lulu today. I'm not going to buy it, but I think what it confirms is that the luxury retail space is still uh, alive and well, and I think that uh, that bodes well for companies like Coors. So, but I'm not going to buy uh, Lulu today on the basis of this big move uh, higher. It probably would need to build uh, some another base, but maybe there's a lot of people shorted. I know that's been one of the favorites of that guy who was short Netflix all the way up. Uh, whatever his name was, and he's talked about it. So hopefully he covered down in here. Uh, if not, there could be some of the shorts covering. And I think that we do have uh, oh, 5.7 days of short interest. That adds up to about, what is that, Dr. K? About uh, 15 million shares short against a float of 100 million. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so not huge short interest, but that's enough to propel it if everybody gets surprised. <clears throat> Let's see. You discussed that you add the sil gold and silver uh, and gold as it rises every 10%. Well, you know, you, everybody's saying, are you suggesting to wait on additional pur purchases? What we're saying is if you're operating on the basis of clear buy points for gold and silver, then the only buy points have been the two pocket pivots that we've identified. Now, if you've set an averaging up program for yourself that every 10% or every 5% or every 20% you're going to add a certain amount, then you simply stick to that rule, but that's something entirely different. Uh, and I would think that anybody who has that sort of idea as to how they're going to average up on their position, that's one way we handle it. But you know, anybody who has a, any idea of, of, of doing that themselves, you shouldn't even have to ask the question whether it's viable here or not. You should already know. If you started out with your initial position in silver, saying to yourself, I'm going to take 10% position here, and then I'm going to add the same number of shares every 10% up. If you are, then you've had several... Uh, instances where you would be adding and on that basis that's pretty simple so but if you're just operating on the basis of the buy points themselves then you're waiting for another buy point some people prefer that because in a lot of ways it is less risky so uh, because you do have very clear areas uh, uh, where you would bail out whereas if you're just buying up every 10 percent uh, that's another issue but we found that you know silver tends to have and gold as well when they get moving they tend to move very sharply and so that strategy can work so and we've implemented it to some extent, but the other thing is these gap ups do create problems in terms of trying to average up. If everything was in uh, was continuous uh, without the gap ups, it would be easier to add, uh, add because what happens is, is our plan was to add up every 10 percent, and some gap ups have taken it up beyond that plus 10 percent. So let's say we ran up six, seven percent, so we're looking for another three percent. And I think this happened in one of these gap ups. We were looking for another 3% on the upside before we would add, and this thing gaps up another 10%. So we're now 15% beyond our original add point. So in our view, we're adding a little higher, so we probably wouldn't go in as heavily. 
But yeah, that's all dependent on how you want to uh, operate with a position. Yeah, it yeah also like uh, these uh, trends that occur usually occur um, when the base is finished uh, forming, and and then I'm more in interested in adding every X percent. So far, this move we've seen is is off the bottom of the base, so it's much more failure prone in terms of pullbacks. Um, so I don't want to just keep adding every X percent, otherwise I'm gonna I could potentially get. Pretty pretty top heavy. I could get a, a position size that's a little bit heavy, especially when we get one of these hairy pullbacks in in precious metals um, as the base rounds itself out. And I don't want to. I, I I that's the thing. You can get scared out of your position if if it's too large. So you have to make sure that um, you know you are employing the, a particular rule in the right context of the market. And I don't I don't think that right now adding X percent up, w given where gold and silver are at, is is the wisest uh, move to make. I'm going to wait for a pullback. Maybe we'll add on a pullback, or what we could also do is wait for the base to round itself out and then reinitiate the uh, uh, buying every X percent up. Yeah. <clears throat> so you know, it, and, but it has been a little bit tricky because of the gap up. So on the other hand, that's a nice problem to have. Uh, Ulta uh -huh. Salons. Let's see. Uh oh, what happened there? Okay, there we go. Uh, that's a big gap up, but I'm I don't know. What do you say, Dr. K? Yeah, I mean I I like it enough to have, you know we put out the report. Um, you know it's a legitimate viable gap up out of a constructive base. Uh, the gap up was due to a strong earnings report. Um, you know it's a the stock the stock all around looks pretty good. Uh, the earnings uh, institutional uh, sponsorship all the, it checks all the boxes. Um, but of course you know if if this closes. Um, you know, if it closes the gap today, then you got to be very careful. Something's wrong with with the viable gap up. Right now, it looks it still looks okay. It doesn't look like it's doing anything particularly wrong. And also, if you okay. if you were to buy it at this current level, um, you know your your cost basis is so low, so low relative to the low of the day that um, if it doesn't go any lower today, your exit point would pr potentially be you know less than one or two percent from your buy point. Yeah, the low of the day though keeps getting lower here as I'm watching it. Now you're 99, 64, 67. So yeah, so yeah, that is one one plus unless the thing reverses all the way. So but you know you got to decide what you're going to do here and and what kind of uh, stop you're going to use. TDG uh, Tredegar, I believe Industries is that right? Transdyne Group. So uh, it's just moving up off the 10 day. I don't know. Is it going to be enough for a pocket pivot? Hard to say. Because you're about halfway through the day, it needs to exceed this day here, so I don't. It may uh, get there. So you just could watch yeah, that. Yeah, stop call. Kane. Uh, it's holding above its 10-day moving average. So the the last place it was viable was at the viable gap up here. So you had to buy it there, and it's never come even tested the high that day. Actually, uh, now it's just holding above the 10-day. So it's just hanging. There's really nothing to think. In your experience, about what percent of viable gap ups hold its bottom? I don't really think that's important. It's whether they do or not, because the one that do, does hold the low and runs, that's the one you want to be in. The rest you can just blow out of really quickly. So it's more a question of that. What about you, Dr. K? What do you say? Yeah, it's, well, it's market con context dependent, of course. So, in other words, if let's say you had a scenario where you had a bunch of pocket pivots and then you had some scary news which took the market lower for two days most of those pocket pivots would probably the stock would probably go below the low of those pocket pivots uh, and then if the market turns back up around and goes and the, the viable stocks are going to turn back around and go so to, to sell them just because it violates the low of the pocket pivot day is not a good not a good strategy you have to always take it in context now on the other hand if you have if you have a strong market environment and you buy a pocket pivot and the stock won't go and then goes below the low of that say say 3 days later in the face of a strong market i'd probably be uh, selling the position and buying something that looks better yeah a couple other names this one in Vincent, since i wouldn't deal with this i don't really see any reason to mess with this so you know it gets this pocket pivot like move at the 50 day but it's so far down there and it's not a big leading stock so there are better stocks to play i would take LinkedIn, Coors, any of these stocks over that any day of the week. So I'm not really interested in it. So, um, and I can't sit here and tell you that you should be owning it necessarily because I wouldn't own it myself. Would you, Dr. K? Uh, no, it's another bottom bottom fishing stock, and there's better stocks out there. Uh, somebody has an upside on FBHS. I don't know what that means. Upside. 
upside. Well, there, it is uh, up yesterday. That's kind of a big pocket pivot. It's a little extended. You had some in here that we talked about um, that we sent reports out on, I believe. And uh, so you already had reason to act on the stock. Now it's just up there. So I don't really know. I can't project any upside potential for the stock from here. But to me, this isn't really the biggest uh, leader in the market to own. I, I prefer some of the bigger, more liquid leaders. But it, and it's acting okay. And it plays on the home building theme. And we've seen Pulte come in with some pocket pivots and it comes up, uh, continues higher. We own some DR Horton. Uh, Toll Brothers has also acted well and I even noticed that I think it's Meritage MH no it's, which one is what is Merit uh, MTH Meritage Homes is uh, acting pretty well had a little pocket pivot type action yesterday maybe it has a little more today so that looks pretty good so GDX how does GDX look to you well, it looks like it's just gapping higher, kind of like silver and gold. So I hope that, that it looks the same to you because if it doesn't, then it means that there's something wrong with my vision or yours. I don't know. But, you know, it's just gapping up. But the miners have gone bonkers. I tend to want to play. You know, the miners look uh, look like silver and gold, but they actually got going later. And so I think there's better percentage-wise, much bigger move in silver and gold, uh, especially if you're playing the 2X ETF. So, but these are all gapping higher in their patterns. That's what they look like. They're deep cups. So, but you know, we already were on to silver and gold long before these started moving, and that's where we're playing. But they they look strong, and that would make sense when you have gold rocketing right now. What is gold at right now? It's uh, 1739. So it's rocketing. You know, so there's not too much to uh, think there. But you know, the miners are all rocketing, and uh, that's all. Good. Cena, somebody asked about. Not not a stock that I'm interested in. Here's a weekly chart. You can see that's just in a big downtrend, and it's just way down there, so it's nothing we look at. Kihu, you know, I think uh, Ross and I were talking about Kihu yesterday, and uh, it's acting okay. An interesting name. I guess they're a competitor to Baidu, but my guess is it's going to need to go sideways. So it's also a thin stock, and it's not marginable, at least where I trade, because it's a thin, funky Chinese stock, and you never know whether it's going to blow up the next day because their financials are all phony. So I don't really tend to want to play there, but it is does look interesting. Pet M, uh, just holding sideways. You had a viable gap up, I guess, here, and it's just tracking sideways. But PetSmart is kind of a boring stock. If I want to own a retailer, again, I want to own Coors. And NetSuite, I actually had that, had written that down earlier. I don't know. Did you clear a pocket pivot yesterday, Dr. K, on this? Maybe just barely. Well, let's see. But it's yeah. it's another. Yeah, yesterday, yesterday I did catch this one. Actually, I saw the pocket pivot, and it's it, it occurs after after uh, a gap up on strong earnings. Um, however, yeah. I really don't like what it did afterwards. That was pretty pretty crazy action. Um, yeah, stock. this, and so we just avoid it. But on a weekly chart, you know, this is what it looks like. These are, are these railroad tracks? I don't know. That's pretty funky, and it goes straight sideways. So it's acting okay right now, but who knows what it'll do tomorrow? So not one we play, but it, and it's a thinner stock too. CRM Salesforce is just building a handle. Had the pocket pivot on this particular day here, and then came back below the 10-day moving hey, average. Yeah. Uh, to me, that's neither here nor there, uh, as uh, you know, the stock's kind of way up there off the 50-day anyways, and it hasn't held above the 10-day long enough for that to be used as a selling guide. So it's just building a sideways pattern. But, you know, I was watching this. We actually bought this day, and then I watched the way it go, went over 150. I just blew that out and took a short, a quick profit uh, in one account that we're managing. And then another one that's a little slower, we kind of hung out, and I think uh, didn't get out until right around here, but we sold it just because it's not going anywhere, and there are other stocks to play. So there goes Apple over 680 now, starting to move. I'm noticing 682. That's acting well. Let's go through some more questions. FITB, uh, what that is. I notice all the financials are looking good. Wells Fargo is another one that broke out yesterday. You can see this. Uh, look at it on the weekly chart, kind of a cup and handle. Goldman Sachs is coming up off its lows very fast, and look at how fast that thing is moving. So you could say this was a bottom fishing type pocket pivot, maybe what, right in here, or I think this one maybe. Uh, but, you know, these take some time to film, and now look at it's rocketing. But I gotta think that with that moving, with Wells Fargo moving, with these other banks and financials moving, 
Uh, the XLF is moving up sharp. I got to think that's a positive for the market overall. So, you know, all those stocks look okay. To me, they're not something I would want to play. PCYC, uh, stocks had a big move, so maybe it needs to build a base. They came out with earnings, uh, was it yesterday, I believe? So they're down a little bit. But it's had a huge move. So it may need some time to build a base. But if you're using, what are you using here as your sell guide here, Dr. K? Let's see, PCYC. Uh, now I would I see on the, a stock like this I would use the uh, 50 day because it violates the uh, 10 day today, but it did it did so in uh, in less than seven weeks. Yeah, and and this looks I mean like a clear leader um, just based on price performance. So yeah, I would I would be using the 50 day um, because this is the kind of stock if you sell it here, given its ferocious price action, it might turn around and, and move higher and you and, and you're out of the position. In other words, it might be tough to buy it back. Right, of the, of the huge price momentum. So the 50-day right. kind of gives you that kind of uh, security in being able to potentially hold it out for a really long, really huge gain. I mean, this thing has already gone from 20, you know, well, from the base breakout, it went from about uh, looks like about 30 up to 70. So it's made a good move. But I mean, we all know that really uh, true leading stocks uh, can go up hundreds of percent. So you don't want to be left behind if this happens to be one of those. Right. ACAM is another, Akamai Technologies, Akamai is another stack stock, as I would call it, because they have server, basically server space. Is that correct, Dr. K? Uh, yes, I believe so. Uh, and you had a pocket pivot yesterday. You had some pocket pivots in here. There's one. I don't know if there's see you go along here. I actually like the way this acts, but to me this has just been you know, very tight in here on the weekly chart for the last few weeks before breaking out. So you're just starting to break out of a base. Probably uh, could be bought, I suppose, if you like it, but I don't think it's your fastest player. I think Amazon is better, and I think Rax is better, although I'd be watching for a pullback. But i got to tell you, Rax is kind of a funky pattern that kind of throws me for a loop just because it's straight up, I mean straight, straight up, you know, without even looking back, really. Every week, boom, higher, higher, higher. And this sort of pattern to me, I think it has to pull back in here and form a base. And if that's true, then really it's only just come out of, the base recently, so the next little second stage base or whatever in here may be a good spot to buy again uh, if the stock sets up. But for now, this thing is way too far. But I think that the strength in this is confirmed by ACAM, and I think it's also confirmed by Amazon, which I think is really the big stock to be in, along with Apple, among the Nasdaq stocks. Yeah, I, I mean, Am a a a Akamai is a great, you know, it's a great company. It's in the right place, you know, in, in terms of. You know, they, they optimize. They're an optimizer um, on on the internet, which is which is what everyone needs um, in terms of uh, you know content and applications. But their chart pattern just doesn't speak to me. It's just it, it's it's not the chart pattern I'd like to see in a leading name. And now that that might change. Maybe this company starts to accelerate its earnings, and we're going to see evidence of that in the price. Maybe it's going to come back up through uh, you know 40, 40 to fifty and do it properly. Um, or maybe have a viable gap up, and then I might get interested. But right now, the the pattern just doesn't look uh, as uh, as electric as some of these other ones. Yeah, no, I prefer, and that's because I prefer Amazon. I think it also has the tablet thing going for it as well. Uh, Polaris, you had a pocket pivot, I think here, but immediately got bought there, and it's moving up. So it's acting okay. It's building a base, not a really tight base necessarily. But it is building a base. So, mm, what do you think of this, Dr. K? Does it get you excited? Polaris has always been, you know, it's, it's just, it's just, a, it's a sog, a bit of a slow chart. Um, yeah, I, and kind of I market so well. uh, and, and it tends to like when it does go, it tends to violate the 50 days. So it's kind of treacherous yeah. in that sense. Yeah, I don't know. It's acting. It's got the pocket pivot, so it's acting okay. But it's not something we get excited about. Edwards Life Sciences had a pocket pivot down in here, and we alerted you all to it. And so now it's breaking out. You had a breakout yesterday, and what was the volume on that yesterday? It was uh, not. Was it that? Was it high enough for a breakout? It was definitely high enough for a pocket pivot breakout. So on that basis, yeah. you could probably just buy it that way. Sure. But it was 36 percent above average, so it's not too bad. Um, you know, so that acts okay, and the medical group is very strong, so that one's fine. And we, we, you know, we thought it was viable down here, so hopefully you picked it up down in here. Uh, we had the pocket pivot. I think it was here or here, one of those days. In any case, you know, closer to 100 or 101, and I think that's uh, a good place to be in it. You could be adding here on the breakout. 
G T L S gutless as I call it. Chart indices. I don't care much for this pattern. It's pretty pretty gutless, but it is a cup with handle, but it, I don't know. Dr. Candy take on that. GTLS. No, I've never. This one has never really. Uh, in stock too. It there's there's no interest. I, I mean, look at the. If you look at the long term pattern, also, it's just um, it never really gets going. You know, you'd have to you have to go back to uh, 2000, two, late 2010, and then it actually had a really that that was more of an aggressive to the upside move um, out of that uh, cup formation where it undercut and then moved to new highs on the weekly, and that that's a lot more of an exciting kind of pattern to me, um, which could have been bought there. And then it promptly uh, doubled the price. Um, and then since it did that, since it, that that's that's the only time it's actually been really viable. And since then, basically since uh, April 2011, it hasn't really gone anywhere. Yeah. But stay tuned. Maybe we'll have something on. Somebody else asking about Lulu. We already talked about that. TSO. That's Tesoro. This thing's way up there, and you're looking possibly if you own it lower. And or if this gets you so excited that you think the stock has a right to do it all over again from here, then I guess you could be looking for a pocket pivot that hasn't occurred yet. So that's probably what you'd be looking for to add to the position uh, if you're interested in uh, if you own it rather, and if you if you're interested in buying it out, you know, for the first time, it's riskier way up here. And uh, you got to also think about this. It's a big move. That doesn't mean that the stock has to do that again. So don't necessarily need to get too excited about it. But if you do own it somewhere you know, down in here, uh, you're looking for a pocket pivot buy point to add. Where do I get the institutional sponsorship information? Uh, it should be available on I think MarketSmith. You can also, if you use Bloomberg, Bloomberg has uh, more up to date information, and I like to use that. Uh, because you can see who the big holders are, and you can see what they've done, and it's much more up to date than uh, what is available on MarketSmith, I believe. I know it's definitely more up to date than what's available on Wanda, which is theoretically uh, MarketSmith's big brother, but I don't know. But I just use the Bloomberg information, which I think is just more comprehensive. It's easily sortable and uh, more more up to date. So, Spelunk. All right. The other day I was talking to Ross and. Uh, Right here on this day, and I said you got to buy Splunk right here, and uh, I think he did. I didn't, and I think he did, and the stock has run up. So, is that a viable gap up? I guess you would say it was on that day. Very sloppy pattern. It's running up to the highs again. So I would like to see it form a handle. That's all I can say about that. But I like that move. Yeah, it's so, a, it's, a, it's a speculative play. I mean, it's an interesting story. He's got that going for it, but it's got no right. earnings and. Um, yeah, it's a choppy pattern, uh, and, yeah. and you know that is a judgment call on our part. You know, it, it's it's a gap up certainly on good earnings and on a great story, but but since the earnings aren't there, uh, you know, you kind of have to ask yourself, well, are we in that market where we can start taking more and more speculative um, uh, trades, um, especially you know in, in terms of what we pass on to our members? And and I you know it, I don't think we're quite there yet. I mean, the market just started; yes. it started on a good rally here, <laughs> so. You know, we're, potentially this window will continue to to open, and you know, the longer the, the longer the trend goes, the, the more speculative uh, we can get. Yeah. Uh, somebody says the uh, Mellanox won't go anywhere tomorrow because it's Saturday. But remember, when we're talking about tomorrow, we mean the next trading day. So, I think you're smart enough to figure that one out, but. Uh, that's what we mean. How's the book coming along? It's it's done. So we even picked a cover the other day, and uh, it should be coming out soon. So we don't know. We haven't been given an exact date. So as soon as we know, uh, you'll all know. CMG, I'm not touching with the 10-foot pole, long or short. So don't need to be short because you're in a bull market. So I don't want to be long it either. When do you take profits on stocks rising fast? Why well, I always take them when I get the most twitchy and nervous? How's that? No. Uh, if you're listening to what we're talking about during these webinars, you can see how we use 10-day moving average violations, 50-day moving average violations. Uh, you know, on, on normal size positions, uh, you want to just sit until you have a sell signal. Dr. K, any comments on that sort of concept? When do you take profits on stocks that are rising fast? I mean, usually I just sit and let them go. If I, if I started thinking too much about that, I would have never made as much money as I did in 1999 when things went up and streaked to the upside. Yeah, I mean it's what Bernard Baruch said a long time. You know, let your winners run, 
and cut your cut your losses short. I mean, it's it's investing 101, which means even if you think a stock is rising too fast, it's rising for a reason. And the best thing to do is just sit back and not touch it. Not not. I mean, I this is the, my trading personality has always been geared toward letting a stock run. I don't care how fast it goes up. I didn't have a problem in the 90s <clears throat> when a stock might make huge moves by leaps and bounds day after day, and I, I would I would generally just just sit. I just sit. I, I had no interest in selling the thing. Now I did create one rule, and this is you know part of Dr. K Laboratory rules, um, that if a stock makes three days of what I would call just ridiculously large gains, and that's a very rare situation. But uh, if you if y'all remember Seek, uh, the uh, search engine company, that had oh, yeah. three massive gains in three days. Um, and we're talking when I say massive gains, I think every day it was up something like 25 to 40 percent. So in three days, the stock had more than double. Um, and what I noticed in all my research studies is that when a stock does that, it's probably best to, on the fourth day, um, sell it when it breaks the low of the close, when it goes below the, low, the, the closing price of the third day. So wherever that closing price is, you sell if it, if it goes below that closing price. And that allows you to keep virtually all of your gains. But it also allows, in, in very rare cases, sometimes a stock will have a fourth day, and then you can enjoy that gain, and you just apply the rule then to the fourth day. So in other words, you, you keep your stops incredibly tight at that point, and that allows you to lock in most of the profits. Yeah, so anyways, I think that if you read our book, the one that came out in 2010, also look on the website and understand the seven-week rule, I think that's a great way to handle stocks. They give you some general, it's a general strategy for how to handle stocks and when to sell them. Have seen a few bases that come down hard, base and round out and round up, but the depth of the base looks to be very deep. Do you take the depth of the base into consideration? Off the top of my head, I would say CMG and QCOR. I don't see CMG and QCOR as stocks that I want to buy. How about you, Dr. K? Uh, QCOR. That's no, not to me. That's not, not a good base. That's not that's pretty, anything there. That's just avoid to be avoided. It's it's too erratic. Yeah. And that that's not. There's nothing there. There's no rounded out thing or anything. It's that's just ugly. So those aren't really stocks we'd be interested in, on that basis. But when they're deep like that and, and ugly looking, that's not really what you want to be buying into. Let's see here. Uh, more people been very helpful reference so far on the book. Okay, we know about the end spin out action. I think uh, what other stock had a, did QCOR have a weird move like that one time? Yeah, uh, there were there were there were there was that I'm one. There's been a, there's been a few in this market. It's been a pretty uh, sketchy market, market environment for some of these names yeah, that have these Alexion, spin -outs. Somebody's asking. Alexion has a decent uh, shot at a pocket pivot. It's slightly extended for the 10 day, so. Maybe it does, but I think it's slightly extended for the 10 day. But it could if it breaks out on the from this pattern here. I think this is what, like a four four week base, five week base? Uh, one, two, three, four. It's a five week base, so if it breaks out and you see some big volume or even enough pocket pivot volume that, that could be a viable spot, I think. You you concur there, Dr. K? Yeah, that sounds reasonable. It's a good company. Yeah. And uh, that looks uh, about right. Let's see, some other stocks. PP breakout today. Yeah, I saw that one. Let's see here. Seems like all of a sudden e signal is getting slow on me. Hmm. Is it PPI? Yeah, you hear me, Dr. K? Yeah, I hear you fine. Okay. I'm not sure. What is a PP? PP, I don't know what that is. Anyways, maybe you can resend that. Uh, ENS, Enersys. Uh, there's a breakout here. It's hanging tight. So you got to, this would be a pocket pivot buy point here. So it's coming in. So it's okay. NSM. Uh, I've been playing this stock. Every time it pulls out, I buy it and it runs up for two or three days. I sell it. So I think this thing needs more time. It's way up there. And we got this one down and two back up to new highs. I think, and you have two down and two up. 
I think you're getting into a spot where either A, this is in the second pullback of an ascending base, which means I think it's going to pull back again, or it needs to build another base. But I, I don't think I want to play this one anymore. I think I bought all the pullbacks, and then when it runs up, I sold it. And it's been nice every time, but I think it's starting to get a little bit long in the tooth here. What's your take on this one, Dr. K? I know, Sam. Is, um, you know, it was, it's, it's been an interesting one. Uh, it's, it's got great, you know, the industry group ranking is number one. And, um, you know, the sales have been explosive. Earnings have been explosive. Um, institutional sponsorship has, has doubled. So it's, it's doing everything exactly as it should uh, right. so that that that's great I mean you know it, it's doing it, you know I just I'd like to see an entry point in this that um, I mean it's just shooting straight up the way it's working and uh, um, I suppose you know it did have a pocket pivot on um, the fourth I think we put a, a report on that it also had a uh, pocket pivot on um, August 28th and um, you know these are these are viable buy points given Given the stocks fundamentals and uh, and the and the you know very strong technical action, but you're in for a ride. I mean, it's going to be quite volatile, as you can see. Yeah. So and you, know, you take that into account. And my tact on this has just been to trade it. So, but you know, if you bought it way back down here, you're obviously still sitting with it, and you would be using the 50-day moving average as your uh, ultimate selling guide. So, but as you you got this pocket pivot, I would think it should move in sideways here and hold the 10-day. Yeah, we've actually mentioned this. Uh, yeah, on both of those days, um, August twenty eighth and September fourth, and uh, we also mentioned it on August fifteenth. So, you know, we obviously we like the stock. Um, it's just a question of how to handle it, and because it is going to be a volatile one. Yeah, but I would say if you're going to try and buy it here, it's risky, and you should be uh, thinking about using the ten day. Somebody asked about CHOC. Um, you shouldn't even be messing with stocks like this. It trades 3,188 shares a day on average. So this one trades by appointment. So I think you have to make an appointment to trade this one. But I, I don't see any reason why anybody would want to mess with this. What is this? It's an ETN. It's just way too thin to play with. So beta cocoa. So I don't know. I don't follow the cocoa markets. Ask us about gold or silver. We have an answer. Cocoa, I don't know. I don't think I even eat stuff too much unless it's... Uh, what what do we eat, Doctor K? What is it you're always buying and making me eat? That ninety percent uh, dark chocolate stuff? Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, well, eighty five percent's good or higher. Um, you could also do one hundred percent cocoa, but that's pretty bitter. <laughs> so if you want to enjoy it, yeah. I like to I like to take eighty five percent and melt it over blueberries. Someone's mentioning because jazz is the one that had that massive spin up. That's right. And when was that? Yeah, was, here's yeah, the day it. that it had. This was last. Was it last year? I think. Uh, yeah, and that that sort of stuff is just nuts. So. Some spinouts recently were due to the nightcap trading right. PPG, that's the one somebody's asking about. And you guys freak me out because I think my system is blowing up on me. Uh, but it's breaking out, you know, but it's slow stock. I think it's in uh, chemicals, and you've seen another a number of chemicals act well. Uh, SciTech Industries is a chemical. There's been a couple others that have acted well. So, you know, the, the group is pretty strong, and it's acted well. So. You know, all of these are, are good. And PPG, if you like chemicals and you like stocks growing earnings at 11%, I don't myself, then on the weekly chart, this is a breakout and is viable on that basis. Yeah, if you look at the really long-term chart on this, it's a very, it's always been a very slow stock. Um, oh, you know, here, so you're here not, we got some, here, you're somebody's not going to get much money. volatility out of it. How about frozen concentrated orange juice market? We're long and strong there, baby. Yeah, these obscure markets, so... But uh, we're not really commodities guys. We do like gold and silver because the, the, we found that the ETFs trade a lot like stocks. Valspar, I believe, is another oil company. No, chemical company that's acting well. What am I saying? Uh, and it's acting well. You know, just had a breakout, and that's about it. It's up, and that's it. It's broken out. There's a top of the base around 54, a little below, and uh, nothing really out, much else to think about that. I'm not a big fan of oil stocks. We never have been. Urban. Is another retailer that's way up there too. It's it's like reminds me of Ann Taylor, you know, same thing. All these things having these big gaps and just going higher. So I stay with this because I think it's newer merchandise and uh, coming out of a first stage base. But all of those look good too, you know, and that's good I think for the whole sector. And I think that's why you want to be in at least one retailer. And of course we like uh, 
Michael Kors, that's our favorite one. So anyways, I think those are all the questions we have for now, and it's 10.13, we've gone over our time. But uh, you can kind of get an idea of uh, what we're looking at here. We'll see how the Mellanox uh, handles itself. Maybe we're not doing anything on it until Monday, but you know, we're just hanging out. The market had a strong move yesterday, don't forget that. So it's entitled, you know, doesn't necessarily have to have another strong move and head higher. You know, you, you start wanting it to happen every day. Things may kind of back and fill a little bit here, and that's okay. And just kind of hang with your positions and stick to your rules. And if you have any real questions uh, that you need answered, you can always email us at, uh, what's the best email address? Info at virtueofselfinvesting.com, or what is sure. it, Dutch Ken? That's fine. That'll yeah, so us. you guys know. Uh, go on the website. You can find it somewhere. But, uh, you know. Email us if you have any questions we can answer. I know somebody uh, was asking us, what is your opinion of the LinkedIn breakout? And I thought that was an odd question because we don't operate on the basis of opinions. We operate on the basis of rules. And so all we know is you had pocket pivots and you buy them and now you have a breakout and the stock's working. So it'd probably have to blow through like 113 or something to get uh, us to cut back our position. But right now we have a good position. We have a low cost basis and we're trying to work it and uh, use that to our advantage and maybe it could happen. Another thing to keep in mind here as you sift through all the news if that's what you like to do is that the two drivers of the market are QE but remember there's all also already a lot of liquidity in the system but yet that liquidity has not really gained any traction anywhere and you know some argue that it has contributed to volatility in the market as financial institutions are just trading the market around but you have that liquidity in there, and you need, it's like a, to me, like a lot of tinder, a lot of dry wood, and all you need is a spark there, and that could send that liquidity uh, into the market in a way that just sends the market up a lot more and a lot faster than people think. And the, the spark that could light it, it might be a change in the government, and I think now with the, both the conventions over, you're going to get a sense of where uh, the front runner is developing, if at all, and I think to some extent the market may be a discounting mechanism for for the election but just try to keep your mind open to the possibilities that it may not be all about QE there may be other factors and the QE may just be the tinder that just needs a spark from somewhere to set off a really strong uh, rally and you have to say that yesterday the Nasdaq index that was those you know and the S&P all these things that was a pretty a bit of a spark going off there so we'll see how this progresses anyways thanks for listening everybody We'll catch you next time. Take care, all right? So long, everyone.